This is the place to find yourself. Istanbul offers great universities and the lifestyle is really amazing here. So I live at the dorms at Maltepe University and I'm really happy with it. There's a cleaning service every few days and then there's the library nearby which is open 24-7. My first impression when I came was like, it's huge. You have everything in one uh, place. When you first come to multiple university, you don't know where what is and you're like, oh my God, I need help. Guess what? You're not alone. There is the international office people over there. They're like family. They're very helpful and they're always there for you. Istanbul is the perfect mixture between ancient and modern. Coming into this city helps me discover myself, learn about so many different cultures, learning about the world, which will help me in writing future books. At Multiple University, we have a lot of research centers. Because of that, we have the ability to participate in a lot of international projects. Here at Multiple University, the education consists of both practical and theoretical. We get the opportunity to practice everything we learn in class in real life. So after we graduate, we have a degree and we can work all over the world. People come to Istanbul all the time, but what they really miss when they visit are the antique shops, which contain thousands of years of memories and also a thread of the modern future. I like to use every minute and just get out and hop on the ferry and just um, go from the Asian side to the European side and just enjoy the wonderful weather with the wonderful Bosphorus behind me and just enjoying the moment of Istanbul. Istanbul is a very beautiful, with great culture. This city is the symbol of diversity. Come and study at Maltepe University. Come here and feel like you're home. Hello everyone, I am Betürk. I will be the moderator for this session. And welcome to the second session of the last day of our Congress. If you have questions, you can send them in the comment section. We start today with our first presenter, Demeter Dimitrov, who is going to talk about the evolution of the architectural at Hoxikech. Now, let's hear it from Demeter. Uh, hello, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the possibility to be part of this really great Congress. Uh, my name is Dimitar Dimitrov, uh, and I'm from uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. I will share now my uh, presentation, which uh, is uh, part of uh, my study, PhD study. Uh, it is uh, named Evolution of Architectural Ad Hoc Sketch. But uh, somebody can always ask what is the meaning behind this uh, ad hoc sketch. Well during the design and construction and mainly the construction of a different project there is uh, there's uh, always those moments when uh, the design lead person which is usually on site is confronted to solve a specific task either due to some uh, technical mistakes in the initial uh, draft or by uh, wrongly executed works there is always a necessity for fast flexible and uh, easy to understand solution and uh, for many years and even now the best approach that gives this uh, flexibility and this uh, strength of expression is the architectural sketch well there are different types of sketches there are those that are more like a piece of art they express feelings visions ideas uh, we are not going to talk about those. Uh, the main focus is about those sketches that contain within themselves a semantic technical value that is necessary to give the solution to the task. So, uh, through the years, I will make a very brief overview of uh, what I and uh, my colleagues we used during different projects, different times, using different tools. And uh, based on this, I will try to make uh, some kind of a conclusion about the future of this uh, expression tool that is uh, nowadays not uh, very popular within the architects, by the way. 
So, um, nonetheless, it's always about drafting or sketching, or sketching something. However, there are two main factors that define the type and uh, the resilience of the architectural ad hoc sketch. It is first the physical instruments that you use to make the sketch, being uh, pencil, pens, markers, watercolors, or whatever you can uh, use, you can uh, have on site, available, of course. And then these are the tools that you use in order to distribute to the uh, relevant stakeholders this sketch and how you preserve it. In the beginning, there was no preservation because once you make the sketch, you give it to the person that requ require it, sorry, and uh, that's it. It disappears, it doesn't exist anymore, and uh, that uh, leads to a lot of bad tracking uh, practices for the documents. But with the appearance of internet and scanner devices, in the beginning it was able to, to scan the drawings, send them via email. Afterwards, with the smart devices, connected smart devices, it was able to directly make photos with different applications of those drawings and send them. And finally, even nowadays, there is a single smart device on which you can do everything from sketching, to distributing, even to use online data. But uh, let's uh, go more in detail in the different types of sketch and the different uh, case studies, if I can uh, call them, that I have stumbled across uh, during my time on site. So uh, usually, uh, as I said, you, when you are confronted, there could be a reason that uh, Either the initial design is lacking the necessary information or there is a technical mistake or even wrongly executed works. And in those cases, you have to provide the solution. This solution must be fast because as fast it is, uh, uh, more impact it has. And uh, it has to be readable. It has to be easy understandable from the different uh, participants in the meeting or on site and uh, this was usually done by sketching the idea or the solution on a paper using pen or a color pens when you need to uh, put uh, more uh, attention to something like uh, levels or uh, levels or dimensions and then it was uh, distributed via first scanning and then sending via email however Using the sketch, it was always possible that you can improve the initial idea. By, by sketching, your imagination is working and uh, sometimes you're able to propose solution which final outcome is much better than what was anticipated in the beginning. Uh, later on, there were many cases in which uh, these kind of sketches were required as a basis of uh, defining the so-called owner's uh, project requirement. So when some person, uh, usually the client, wants to have something, this something usually sees additional to the larger project which you are working on, and he wants some additional things. Those additional things have to be designed, priced, and constructed. And in order to have uh, best understanding from all sides in this project, the best way for you to present the client's idea before him and he say, yes, this is what I imagined. Uh, and also to, to give it as a background for the engineers to start developing their design parts, it was used this kind of uh, I can call this, uh, you know, analogical augmented reality. So you make picture, this picture is printed, you put a tracing paper on it, you draft on the tracing paper and make something like uh, collage or augmented reality fixed, if you want to say. During the time we use those kind of approaches, they were okay, but nowadays, such work requires too much resources, meaning resources of the architects involved, 
resources for printing, for scanning, for uh, consumables of the different printers and so on. So this was useful, but nowadays this is too costly in uh, mainly in uh, time, in the resource of time. So uh, this is uh, another approach, uh, totally different from the previous. And uh, the main issue is that uh, when uh, a bigger project is being developed, uh, there usually is a uh, wrong assessment of the necessary level of detail that the different design parts involved in the project must provide. For example, let's say if you have uh, 80,000 or 100,000 square meters project, sometimes there are specific points on areas of the project which the designers didn't miss or didn't put the necessary amount of detail in order for the construction company and mainly the workers on site to understand what is the idea. Uh, in my experience, this usually is connected with the vertical planning and with the geodesy. And one of the most flexible and fast ways to solve those issues uh, is to make fast sketch uh, with whatever uh, tools you can find, uh, mainly pencil and uh, maybe a colored pen in order to show the more important data on the drawing. And uh, by this time, the smart devices, meaning phones, were usually available everywhere. So you can picture the image by the specific uh, application that stretches the image and works uh, very close, works like a scanner itself. And you can even distribute it directly from the phone, first to the client, second to the construction company, and third, to the support team in the office that could be even abroad uh, so they can start even developing those details. Because anyway, at the end, it's good to have a technical drawing as part of the total set. However, providing such solution in this way for a short period of time is a very good way to earn the respect of the different stakeholders that are presented on site. Uh, later, with the appearance of uh, much more advanced smart device tablets and uh, styluses and uh, different applications that can use those instruments, it was totally able for a design lead architect or somebody who is presented on site to make directly colorful, crispy, and easy sketches directly on the tablet using his stylus. Uh, the possibility uh, of making pictures also on site, pictures of the specific uh, problematic issue for which you have to make a proposition, uh, and uh, drafting your solution on top of these pictures in real time within the amount of five to 10 minutes prove to be really a versatile tool in the hands of the architects. Uh, and uh, as this uh, smart device is uh, connected, so you have access to the internet, you can distribute this uh, to the different stakeholders. You can apply, uh, let's say, more formal text, uh, text not only drafting. Uh, and uh, it was all in one. You have something that is just a little bit bigger than a notepad, but you can have it with you everywhere and you can perform this task everywhere, even on the roof or inside uh, some kind of basement or many, many different, uh, not very friendly in environmental uh, point of view, uh, construction areas where you have to work with uh, different people. Uh, this option also for making pictures and uh, saving the accumulated data within your notepad or even uploading it in uh, some kind of cloud-based solution or a server uh, gives the possibility for you to, to make different uh, step 
step-by-step -step solutions for different areas of the building when required by the client. And you can always step review what was proposed in the beginning, what was the outcome, how you can improve the outcome. And all this can be done on site directly with minimum uh, time uh, using this uh, now available very modern tools for sketching. One additional very important uh, strength of this uh, type of uh, expression, the ideas, is that uh, by making pictures and the possibility of like every digital tool to make copy of different pictures, or, uh, format the pictures, make them uh, you know, more pale, uh, and this only with uh, just several touches with your hand gives the possibility for you to make step-by-step uh, -step stories in which you uh, explain what is the solution and how it's going to be executed within uh, the whole time period. And this is very useful when uh, on site uh, there are many different subcontractors and uh, one party is responsible for one part of the works, second party is responsible for the second part of the works and etc. Then by using this kind of approach, it is very easy to disseminate the different responsibilities between the different uh, construction companies, let's say so. And it is very clear who have to start, who works after who, and it is very helpful and uh, organizes the work. This uh, is something that I've used, by the way, two months ago. Uh, this is a very interesting background story. Uh, it is uh, part, or it was part of the suburban area of uh, Plovdiv, city of Plovdiv in Bulgaria which in the beginning of uh, 19th century was an uh, industrial area which was far outside the city. And uh, by this time, uh, the industrial zone was uh, consisted mainly of uh, storages and uh, production facilities for tobacco and tobacco-based products. So afterwards, of course, with the growth of the city of Plovdiv, this suburban uh, area became part of the city. And now uh, this uh, area is called the Tobacco City. Uh, however, a uh, big portion of the buildings there are old uh, industrial buildings of different size and function. And nowadays, within this uh, district, which is uh, residential and retail, there are many uh, projects that are being developed. And there are many interests that they want to put some new life and new, new strength in this uh, area of uh, Plovdiv. However, due to the time and due to the, you know, absence of uh, the local municipality of interest, those buildings were left uh, with the time to uh, degradate. And even there were several fires here and there because they were used inappropriately by different kinds of people. However, few years ago, maybe, it was uh, this entire area was declared to be a architectural heritage monument. Uh, and uh, it uh, started to be under more specific uh, preservation. And all uh, projects that are being developed have been uh, put uh, under much bigger review from the relevant authorities. However, we were employed by the municipality to help them make the general urban plan of the area. And as usual, what is required for urban planning, it's uh, in, with a very low level of detail. This uh, low level of detail is mainly because they require entire elevations of, uh, alongside of uh, streets, plans of entire neighborhoods and so on. So they miss the detail. And when you go on the official discussions uh, with the municipality and uh, all uh, residents in the area, 
it is really versatile that I was able to use the connected device and to download data from Google Earth. Why? Because on site, most of the buildings are destroyed with the years. But in Google Earth, you have data that was uh, data consisting of pictures, of course, uh, done by the satellite that is going back to 1995. So I was able to, uh, to find the closest uh, position in which those buildings are still intact and uh, download the picture directly from the device and use it in the device to sketch the solution in more detail, in more, uh, how to say, easy to understand uh, volumetric solution for the entire area for different buildings. And this proved to be very well accepted by all uh, participants because it uh, shows that you are capable to provide and express your ideas and solutions very fast. This uh, sometimes is uh, very valuable, especially when the atmosphere is uh, starting to become nervous in some occasions. Uh, so, what uh, is this? I have uh, put this slide at the end. Uh, it's not at the end, but I added it last. Uh, because I was wondering how to approach this. This is uh, this great architect, Ludwig Miss van der Rohe, that maybe most uh, architects have heard of. So this is a picture of him working on his presentation and part of his presentation of one of his uh, projects. This project is uh, for a skyscraper on Friedrichstrasse in Berlin. And this was done 1921, means that these pictures are from precisely 100 years ago. And what we see, we have the same uh, view from a picture, we have the same kind of a collage and augmented picture with that. Uh, by the time he done those uh, things and he working on those projects, uh, the, the, the movie industry was uh, starting to implement new techniques that he is uh, very, how to say, ambitious and uh, always future thinking person implemented inside his, his uh, design process. But uh, when I uh, was reviewing his work, I said, okay, what? He was doing the same 100 years ago and he achieved let's say, nearly the same result. Okay, maybe it was more time consuming and more resourceful, but uh, at the moment we have uh, the possibility to make it fast. But is it different? Well, at the moment, most likely it's not. But there are some signs that the future is going to change this and uh, it is going to change it very fast. How? Nowadays, the same smart connected devices give a great, great opportunity for very fast and easy sketching directly a three-dimensional objects, which could be items, which could be buildings, part of the buildings, part of the installation or something just for fun. And then directly from the same device, you're able to deploy the so-called augmented reality. Those of you who do not know what is augmented reality, this is a implementation of a virtual image on top of the reality. Why this is the future? Because 2016, uh, Martin Bros, this is a construction company in the United States, successfully made an experimental in closed environment, of course, for making a construction work without any paper. Meaning that the entire information of the project uh, in the form of uh, information model, it was uh, uploaded in uh, augmented reality Googles, so the worker who just uh, make a very simple stud structure, of course. The worker was able to take all necessary measurements, uh, to check the measurements, to see if they fit 
what are the necessary steps of the design without having a single drawing on paper. Everything was displayed as an augmented reality on top of these goggles. This was 2016. Nowadays, there are many companies around the world which are working for a practical implementation worldwide for the augmented reality during the construction process. What can happen? Well, I think that uh, with the, all this digitalization that is the future and uh, the idea of uh, having common data environment for all participants in the design, engineering and the construction processes of a building or a project, they can work in one environment. They can see what everybody makes, works and can check see and imagine what are the idea. This, this is the future. The future is the digitalization, mainly the digital twins. And uh, the general idea behind this whole presentation was that even that the sketch is a very old uh, and traditional tool, uh, the instruments for its implementation are evolving with uh, as everything else. They are starting to be digital and they have the necessary capacity in order to fit in the next future and still to be useful for the work that usually architects and the different designers do. Uh, my conclusion is that even nowadays, uh, more of the students which are going to be future architects are focused on uh, three-dimensional visualizations and are neglecting some basic uh, sketching capabilities. Uh, my advice is that uh, they still have to see and to know what are the possibility of those instruments because using a sketching, nonetheless, in what uh, approach you're going to do it and how you're going to distribute it, it is much faster and uh, sometimes, as I said, it is crucial. So I really hope that the architects of the future will use the available digital tools and will continue to make the necessary sketches in, uh, in the way that architects are supposed to do, not only to rely on uh, computer generated uh, images. So, uh, this was uh, everything from my side. Once again, uh, thank you for being a part of this uh, really nicely organized Congress. I would like to thank you, Dimitar, uh, for your presentation and participating in our Congress. Thank you. And now we will continue our session with our next presenter, Neha Koklekar will talk about improving vision of the innovation. Now, let's hear it from her. Hello, everyone. I'm Neha Zogarkar, a design student from NMIMS, uh, in NMIMS School of Design, India. Thank you for inviting me to this Congress. Uh, oh, the screen share. So the title of my paper is Improving the Vision of the Univision. Um, it is impossible for us to imagine our lives without eyes, eyesight today. But what about the ones who don't have eyesight since birth? We can't even imagine the difficulty they might be facing in this world, where most of the facilities, constructions, gadgets are as per the convenience of the people with sight. Improving the vision of the Univision means uh, improving the lives of the blind or the visually impaired. Being blind means lack of vision, the vision that cannot even be corrected by glasses or contact lenses. There are two types of blindness, partial blindness, uh, which means your very limited vision, and complete blindness, which means you cannot see anything at all. Most of the people refer to blindness mean complete blindness. According to WHO, 
that is the world health organization a person is said to be legally blind if your vision is 20 by 200 or if the field of vision is less than two less than 20 degree that means if an object is 200 feet away you have to stand 20 feet away from it in order to see it clearly as per the estimation children face maximum problems to cope up with blindness at least 2 lakh children in India have severe visual impairment or blindness and approximately only 15,000 are school going children. So what about the non school going children? The children come from coming from the well to do families get the privilege to go to school, but at the end of the day get bullied, harassed or pitied upon. Also, many a times because of being blind. The children are considered a burden, unwanted by their own family, or even worse. This may affect the child's mental conditions and lower the confidence level. Whereas, the non-school-going children are usually from poor or not well-to-do families. These children face, face problems starting from their birth. Uh, various diseases, problems, uh, lack of money, uh, um, and also they die due to road accidents. Uh, inequality or being treated differently can promote anger in these children and can impact them negatively. Hence, to analyze the interaction of blind and sight children and trace down the problems to enhance the lives of blind children and support them in a right way is the main problem statement of my paper. Therefore, before solving any problem, we should understand the situation properly so that we can give an effective solution. So as per the report of a study group, 88.2% of uh, visually disabled in India, in India are preventable. One such story of Vinod Daniel, CEO of Indian, Institute, Indian Vision Institute, collaborated and provided 18 states in India with eyeglasses. In six months, in, uh, in six months, they reduced violence, accident, and even provided the children by simply giving them right perception glasses, uh, healthy, nutritious food, and giving proper road direction guidance. This is one such case to take inspiration from. Therefore, there are some design solutions which can help the non-school going children. Guide dogs. These dogs are said to be very friendly and very well trained so that they can navigate uh, obstacles, road signals, or any kinds of dangerous pro or any kinds of dangerous thing and are not very costly for a person to buy. Pavements. The government can adopt ways like round units or different floor texture at the end of every pavement so that the children can feel and understand the road directions conveniently. This can also prevent a number of accidents from happening. Similarly, symbols on the walls or symbols on medical packets can be used to understand proper directions and if the medicines are dangerous or not. Whereas for the school going children, tape recorders, pocket magnifiers, accessible calculators are the most helpful devices. They can, uh, they can be used in schools to study and be on the same page as others. Braille printer, printers to print information from internet in Braille by connecting it to computer or a digital gadget and immersing dots in heavy paper makes it easier for the kids to read worldwide information, news, and also and it is very helpful for them. Also, a precautious solution that is taping the electronic cords or wires in schools, institutes, or any dangerous places is beneficial. Increasing awareness in the society plays a crucial part in improving the lives of the blind. Some refinements like showing short films on, uh, based on the problem space, making posters and spreading it on a national platform, removing the barriers, improving the opportunities for the blind, changing people's perspective are the most significant determinants to improve the life changes for the blind children. NGO support can help these children uh, live a productive life. 
today blind children are capable of doing many things all all they need is proper guidance direction and appropriate step that uh, that an ngo can help in also bringing positivity providing the children with good education shelter equipment scholarship encouraging the children to do art travel uh, play sports uh, merging them with the sight people giving them fair treatment will surely create a better world for everybody to live in i would like to share one of my experiences uh, on the topic uh, there is a blind school for girls right across my street i've seen girls buy groceries catch buses on their own to go home taking an opportunity i did talk to one of the girls she was like the most confident girl that i had ever met she told me that her basic needs were being fulfilled by government scholarship and ngo funds because of which she could get an opportunity to study have friends and prove her world uh, prove herself to the world this is a kind of positivity equality and awareness that everyone uh, that should reach in the world so let's start by changing our perspectives first Thank you for listening to me and letting me share my views on the subject. I would like to thank you, Neha, for your presentation and participating in our congress. Thank you. And now we will continue our session with our next presenters, Adriana Faiska. We'll talk about the Art Osmosis Manifesto. Now let's hear it from her. Hello everyone, uh, I'm going to start sharing. I am Adriana and I am from uh, Portugal. Uh, start sharing. Okay. Okay. Feel. Uh. Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, I'm going to present uh, my master thesis, which is focused in um, in uh, okay, which is focused in um, in the art of uh, Nadir Afonso, which is uh, an architect and a painter from the University of Porto. So uh, the thesis is. Um, try to answer uh, the question can the architect relate architecture and painting through his his artwork uh, to analyze nadir afonso's work it was we had to divide the thesis in three phases the first one it was a, a study about history of painting and architecture relationship the second one especially the case of nadir afonso's work and the third one which was a personal practice based on nadir afonso's work the case of study nadir afonso uh, Nadir Afonso was born uh, in the north of Portugal, uh, in Chaves, in uh, 1920. And uh, since a really early age, he had contact with art from his family. Um, in the beginning of his career, or not, not specifically a career, but uh, since he started painting, um, he, uh, he had contact with... Uh, with uh, um, with another artist uh, because he he used uh, for example pulses and reference to start his own uh, language as we can see on the left uh, Laroque Saint André uh, which used the same technique of course he was really young so he didn't had uh, uh, enough uh, studies but it's a really nice uh, and interesting way for starting uh, painting by his own uh, after he finished high school, he moved to Porto, uh, which is the second uh, biggest city in Portugal. And uh, he was going to start uh, painting in the Fine Arts uh, Academy of Porto. However, and after talking to an employee, uh, he enrolled in architecture. Uh, but this is not going to, to make him stop developing his own, uh, his own uh, linguistic um, technique in painting as we are going to see uh, in the in the rest of the presentation so um even though he was studying architecture 
uh, he used to work um, he used to work as if he was doing a uh, painting so basically he would uh, do architecture in vertical so in this period of time he had a lot of paintings that uh, are famous special this one a ribeira which is a competition that he won uh, and and he started doing a lot of ex exposures uh, with exhibitions with his uh, with his uh, linguistic uh, technique which is a reference with the uh, older painters uh, from portugal uh later and uh, there was a trip in in the south of Portugal, which it's supposed to all the students uh, to to know each other. And basically, in this trip, there are going a lot of students from uh, sculpture, painting, and architecture. Um, however, and in all of those experience outside of uh, the classes, uh, Nadir Afonso always enrolled. Uh, as a painter, so he was uh, using the tools and uh, the tools and the knowledge that he was acquiring in architecture uh, school, and he was uh, using them for uh, developing a personal uh, a personal uh, painting. Basically, he was also one of the first abstract paintings uh, painters in Portugal. As you can see, uh, before we had some uh, a language that were more realistic, and in this case, we start entering in the surrealism uh, period. After uh, he finished uh, the university, he moved to France because he wanted to enroll in the Parisian uh, Parisian uh, scene. However, it was very difficult because he was first he was very young, he didn't know no one in Paris. So, uh, and even though he won a scholarship to start studying in Ecole de Belle uh, Beaux Art in Paris, um, it wasn't enough what made him end up by starting a collaboration with Le Corbusier. In fact, he was one of the persons that was res uh, responsible for the Trois Terrasses, the Unité de l'Habitation. So basically, he did some of the draws that we can see here in the Trois Terrasses. Another project that was very important where he worked on was the Cloud Eduval factory. Uh, once he was uh, responsible for the using of modular in this factory. So that means he had a lot of control of shapes, proportions, uh, not only in architecture, but he also used that knowledge for painting. As we can see, uh, this is in the same uh, period of time. He started a period that calls geometric period, where he was using, of course, we can see the knowledge of uh, Le Corbusier for the colors and for the, the, the shapes. Later on, he developed um, a period that is uh, inside of the Pedro geometric shapes but a little bit more complex where he where he starts to understanding that we don't need specific to use um, perfect geometric shapes to find harmony basically uh, this was the the need uh, and the focus that you that he was having on uh, on painting uh, what, she, what is actually funny because in the project before in the uh, Clouded Valve Factory, which was his final work uh, from the university, he named it uh, Architecture is Not an Art. It's not that he was uh, presenting that, uh, it, it doesn't mean that he was believing on that completely, but he was trying to provoke something. Uh, he was trying not to justify architecture and the, and the and the architectural linguistic uh, just by saying that it is an art but trying to find the scientific side of of it so um having that in mind and in the end of the presentation we'll see you will see the develop the development of that uh, that evolution uh, of that evolution uh, after um after the collaboration will with call with Le Corbusier, he had some um, some uh, 
some uh, periods that were focused in other architectural elements, not specifically Corbusier. On the left, we have Le Spiralis, which is a, a, a board that was done uh, focused in the Baroque period of Porto. And on the right side, we have Osidish, which is um, after a trip that he had done to Egypt. So basically, it's focused in the mythology and also in hieroglyphs. Um, after th those experiences, he had the opportunity because he was invited to go to Brazil and start a collaboration. Um, during this period of time, he had the opportunity to collaborate with uh, Oscar Niemeyer, where he uh, was uh, responsible for the 14th century uh, exposition and also the second office that Niemeyer was going to open. So first, he moved to Rio, and second, he also moved to Sao Paulo, where he was responsible for that office. In the left, we see some studies that he was developing in Oscar uh, Niemeyer's office that we can see on the right that he used some uh, studies, some personal studies that he was developing by his own, using adapting it to architecture. After he collaborating with uh, Oscar Niemeyer, and it was uh, a huge moment in Brazil because it was the modernism in Brazil, uh, he returned to Paris. Um, there wasn't any problem. He just wanted to keep developing his personal uh, language in, uh, in painting. And Paris was also a huge center of culture and art. Uh, so he moved to Paris to starting a collaboration with the three old colleagues from the ATBAP, ATBAT, which is the Le Corbusier office, uh, where he uh, projects, this building was never built, but is a rotating theater. And here is uh, one of the buildings that it more represents the painting and the architecture connecting each other and working together as one. Because here we can, this is based on the cine, cine, le, cinematic art, which is um, focused in the movement. So basically here there was a period of time where it was architecture, uh, paint and sculpture uh, trying to focus in the movement of art. And uh, in this specific uh, building, it of course it would not move, it wasn't designed uh, like that, but it was designed to have multiple project, uh, projects. Uh, there was a lot of images that was projected to the walls, they, were, they, they would be uh, moving. And also the, um, the project itself, it's all in open space, so it can promote uh, the free circulation of uh, the people. Parallel to this period, he was developing um, a personal uh, personal uh, painting that was Spas Limité, which was also focused in the movement of the painting. So in the left, we can see the Machina Cinetica, which was um, which was uh, a device that would have a mechanic element that would make the board um, move. So this board, even though we can see that it's, uh, of course it's stop, but we can see that he was designing all the elements like old cinema that would move itself and it would make uh, a movement. Uh, so this board, it's, uh, it's supposed to be watched uh, in the movement, not like this. Um, even though uh, he was having a success as an architect and uh, already as a painter, uh, he stopped working uh, as an architect. Uh, he stopped working as an architect. In the late uh, works of his uh, of his career, we show this, which is the Panificadori de Chaves, because it has a lot of uh, reference from also Le Corbusier and uh, Oscar Niemeyer, which was the main reference that he will uh, develop also in his painting. Basically here on the left, we can see there is a metric uh, uh, orthogonal uh, mesh that, is, that was also took from the uh, Claudio Duval factory and also the roof that was taken from, uh, from, the, from Oscar Niemeyer architecture. Uh, in this uh, time, he already stopped. Uh, he already stopped uh, uh, working as an architect. However, he started 
painting specific, uh, specifically uh, cities. Uh, so there, there's something very important to understand in Nadir Afonso's work. He he published a lot of books uh, trying to explain the theat the his theater, uh, no, his theoretical uh, work. Uh, where um, he justify his uh, his paintings, um, it's very complex to to explain. But ba but basically, he study physics and uh, and um, and a lot of uh, scientific uh, areas to try to understand how he can uh, explain some uh, some um, the complexity of the painting and basically in a really short version he says that the world is uh, is under uh, scientific laws such as physics and uh, however the art is under a mathematic law so even though we cannot see the structure of the painting we feel we feel harmony because there are squares uh, circles um, triangles that they don't need to be necessarily exposed on the painting but they can be in the complex uh in a complex uh, structure that will make us feel the harmony this is the last period that that uh, from his painting which is the factual period and the uh, pre in the geometric uh, uh, period where we can see um, some of so he returns to a more linguistic, uh, uh, more realistic uh, uh, language. However, he doesn't stop using that structure that he developed during all the period of his career, but start using it uh, to the final to his final paintings. Um, so basically, the, the the conclusion is that even though uh, the the art, the, the the architecture, so the archi in in this conclusion, architecture is an art, but it has a scientific knowledge that it needs to be uh, that needs to be uh, studied to arg to argument and to explain a lot of uh, thoughts that usually uh, they are a little bit uh, abstract so it's difficult to justify a lot of a lot of uh, things and um, and uh, that the project itself it doesn't need also to be just an architectural uh, a building project but it can be used to pursue and develop the creativity and it can be uh, done in other areas the knowledge that we acquired in architecture doesn't need to be uh, specifically to be used only in architecture of course it can it can be done and we are architects but it can also be used for developing other arts basically that's it I would like to thank you, Adriana, for your thank presentation you. and participating in our Congress. And now we will continue with our next presenter, Sheval Kalkan, who is going to talk about big data and applications. Now, let's hear it from Sheval. Okay. 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 Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And I hope you are all well and healthy. And as Betu said, I'm Shevay Kalkan from Turkey. And I'm studying at Eskisher Technical University and um, in the Department of Industrial Engineering. And okay, I'm sharing my screen. Today, um, I'm going to talk about um, big data and applications uh, in general. Um, OK. But um, in addition, I will try to focus the titles um, such as characteristic of big data and Im the importance of big data. Um, let's start with um, what is big data 
Okay. Big data and the words you search for in search engines, the interactions you make on social media accounts, the movements in your bank account, in short, all the interactions made by individual users on the internet are recorded as digital footprints and constitute a very important source of information. And the concept of big data in which it is collected in a meaningful, meaningful way and forms a whole was first um, used in the fields of astronomy and genetics and started to show itself in all areas in, of life with the digitalizing world. Big data is a collection of data collected from different sources and it's um, useful only when it's transformed into a meaningful, workable and usable form. And I think it's the most important part. And when interpreted with the right strategies, it enables companies to make effective decisions, manage risk and develop innovative policies. And let's continue with um, where the big data um, using in sectors. And big data includes data such as sensor information, text, photographs, and files, which are constantly growing in the digitalizing world. Many industries can analyze the needs of customers using data science, provide individual services using specific segments, and run their operations efficiently. Although big data is used in many sectors, examples of uses of big data in different sectors include health, education, energy, transportation, and production. Um, but um, big data is, of course, not um, used only in these sectors. But um, today I will talk about the five sectors and their application applications. Um, let's start with health sector. And hospitals contribute to the improvement of healthcare services by storing individual data. And a large number of medical records helped the development of data driven medicine technology in the early diagnosis of the disease and the development of new drugs. Big data in health sector examples I can tell um, telemedicine, um, reducing fraud, and risk and disease management. Let's continue with education. Individual learning techniques can be used by using big data in the development and improvement of learning process. Um, now I will tell you about one of the um, five applications in which big data is used um, in the field of education in 2021. And one of the most important uh, interesting and useful big data application in education is the process of gaining students' attention. And big data experts have planned to use biometric data of students, such as heart rate and facial expression and objects, and they touch during the lecture. This information can be captured via a camera on the sailing or a device resembling a smartwatch. And this data can be used for analyzing how attentive each student is. And I think it's uh, very important. In the energy, uh, firms process personal data of users using smart grids and meters. Early detection of problems can be observed by providing better resource and workforce management thanks to big data. Let's continue with production. Um, big data is used to support decision making process, like um, uh, hard, um, like health sector and in production and also production and sourcing. And thanks to big data, institutions can obtain competitive advantages, advantage by um, extraction information models from demographic, graphical, textual, and temporal elements. Okay. Let's continue with transportation. Institutions use big data to plan the best transportation route, develop smart transportation system, and control traffic. Um, as you know, the biggest uh, issue in the transportation industry today is the constant lack of time. Um, as freight transport demands increase, the transportation companies need solutions to manage lo logistic and supply chain operation more efficiently more effectively in the process of uh, searching for this solution an emerging number of companies are embracing the um, opportunities that big data provides the practice of um, using big data includes collecting um, reliable 
um, relevant electronic information from various sources in a very short amount of time. The gathered data is then used for analysis mean to identify patents that can help the company to predict some future events. This practice brings lots of advantages to the transportation industry. <clears throat> now, um, I want to I want to uh, talk about characteristic of big data. And big data has five components called 5V, but um, there are also many um, components of big data. But in generally, um, there are um, general five components, and I want to focus on the five components. And first one, the um, first one of the components is volume, and the amount of the amount of the data has increased more than 40 times in the last 10 years and is expected to show in the future. With increase in the data obtained so much, it's of great importance that the data is not kept as a pile, but controlled by the relevant institution and organization. And the second one is um, velocity. And in response, to the amount of data that increased geometrically with the um, increase of technological innovation, it is necessary to have a certain infrastructure and speed in terms of both hardware and software in order to increase the proce um, processability of the data. And the third one is variety. Data from fonts, um, tablet, uh, tablets, computers, and different operating systems come in different formats. In order to process data uh, with a wide variety, it must be converted to the same format. And uh, other components is veracity. The data in the data stack must be in the right layer and safe during the flow. How much of the data obtained, under which conditions, and by whom can be um, accessed are among the issues that should be emphasized. And OK, the last one is value. The most important component in big data is that the data obtained and processed add value to the institution and organization. The fact that the data obtained as a result of the analysis and simulations benefit the institution or organization shows that it serves the right purpose. OK. Um, I want to talk about the importance of big data because um, we are um, living in a digital um, world, but um, um, we don't know um, we don't know that um, how much important the big data is. But um, Okay, with big data, institutions and organizations can use their data to examine consumer behavior and develop correct and effective strategies. Um, with the big data obtained after processing, um, the reactions of the consumers can be observed in advance. Unlike traditional methods, big data provides saving labor, production of products and services suitable for needs, lowering costs and faster and more efficient decision making and i think it's the most important part but um, although big data has many contributions to our daily life there are still many disagreements about the privacy security and violation of the data use and uh, security is the very important mm -hmm. because um, we are using uh, many social media accounts and um, but we don't know the um, security part. And before I finish, um, there's something I want to tell um, you. And don't remember, if you don't pay the product, you are the product. OK, thank you for listening to me. Um, I enjoy sharing them with you. And I hope you enjoy it too. I wish you all a good and uh, health day. I feel um, very lucky to be in this Congress. And I thank you, the team, um, very much. OK. I would like to thank you, Sevray, for your presentation and participating uh, in our Congress. I'm glad to meet you.
We will have a break uh, before the third session of our Congress. Uh, break is until 8, uh, 3.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us. See you at the third session. <laughs>